Well, as you're seated, please open your Bibles to the first book, or the first verse of the book of Exodus. I'm thrilled to be able to open Exodus tonight. It's just been a great time over the last couple of months as I've been working through this book. Um, as you're making your way there, Exodus is part two of the book of Moses, Moses known as the Pentateuch, meaning five scrolls, corresponding to the first five books of our English Bibles And all five scrolls were written by Moses um, as one unit. And the Pentateuch was Israel's first Bible. It's referenced hundreds of times, or if not thousands of times in the rest of Scripture. It was written for the the second generation of Israel that was born in the wilderness after the first generation had died out because of sin. Uh, They needed to understand their origins and their unique relationship to Yahweh and how to live in the promised land. It also served as a warning not to repeat the sin of the first generation. So Exodus 1.1 begins, Now these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. Uh, A single letter conjunction at the beginning of the verse connects it to what came before in Genesis. Exodus does not stand alone. Rather, it is in continuity with what came before it and what came after. While Genesis covers over 2,000 years, most of it occurs in the first 11 chapters. Surprisingly, the last 39 chapters of Genesis cover the same length of time as Exodus 1, about 300 years. And in Exodus, Moses speeds through 300 years to bring us quickly to the main narrative of Exodus. And this serves as a natural division between the first chapter, Genesis, and the second chapter, Exodus. Exodus is named after the most dramatic event, the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt. Israel's identity is so thoroughly tied to the Exodus that if you could ask Israel, Israel, who are you? Israel would respond, oh, we are the people who were redeemed out of Egypt. And if asked, who is God? Oh, he's the God who redeemed us out of Egypt. Understanding the Exodus is critical to understanding the rest of our Bibles. Exodus is even referenced in the book of Revelation. And to understand Exodus, we need to also be reminded about Genesis. In Genesis, we saw God's purpose to fill creation with his image bearers, who are to live in the presence of God, in relation with God, or in his relational presence, And these image bearers were also to rule over creation on his behalf. Man was to be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, work and keep the garden, and extend the blessing and rulership of the garden to the entire world. But the fall worked against all of that. But all hope was not lost. God promised a singular seed of the woman who would conquer the serpent and his seed. And most pertinent to the book of Exodus... Abraham was promised descendants, a land, and a relationship. Yahweh would be their God, and he would be, and they would be his people. When Genesis ends, there has been no significant fulfillment of most of the promises. So, from there we'll look to, what is the purpose of Exodus? Exodus calls Israel's second generation to know Yahweh. And to obey him by revealing his holiness and demonstrating his faithfulness. His faithfulness in multiplying them, in delivering them from Egypt, and establishing his presence among them. Well, how should we view the purpose of Exodus for us as we read it? Well, write down Romans 15, 4. And I'll read it. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through the perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. God intends Exodus to be an encouragement for later generations, including the church, as we behold God's holiness, his faithfulness, and his glory. And also write down 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. In speaking about the first generation of Israel, Paul says, Now these things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instruction. As we see the sin of the first generation in the wilderness, it should serve as an example, a warning to flee idolatry, to flee disobedience and grumbling, and pursue obedience to Christ. So with that, 
we will move to the structure of Exodus. For purposes of tonight, we'll be walking through a, a thematic outline of the book of Exodus. In the first section, we see divine deliverance by multiplication and redemption. That'll be the first 18 chapters. And then we'll see divine relationship through covenantal instruction, 19 through midway through 24. And then finally, divine presence facilitated and preserved. We will walk through the sections of the book, paying attention to some of the key themes and events. And at the end, we'll consider application for our own lives. We'll be turning to a lot of passages, and occasionally I will leave a chronological reading of Exodus to maybe go backwards a little bit, but I would recommend that you stay where we're at, um, and I'll I'll return, I'll catch up again. That'll probably be the easiest way for you to follow along. So the beginning section that we'll look at tonight is divine deliverance by multiplication and redemption. The first section we'll look at is God multiplies. And please turn to Exodus 1-7. Exodus opens up where Genesis ends. Jacob and his sons have moved to Egypt and eventually died there. And throughout the first 22 verses, the narrative moves quickly to 350 years after the arrival of Jacob and his family in Egypt. And God was incubating his chosen nation, multiplying them, and preparing them to begin to receive what he promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. And in that time, Israel had grown from 70 people at the end of Genesis to over 2 million people by the beginning of Exodus 3. In Genesis 48, 4, God said, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply. Now look down at Exodus 1, 7. But the sons of Israel were fruitful and increased and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty, so that the land was filled with them. Already, we see God was fulfilling his promise to make Israel fruitful and to multiply them. At the end of Genesis, Israel was in a privileged condition with their brother as the prime minister in Egypt. But over the decades and centuries that followed since Joseph died, Israel's multiplication had alarmed the pharaohs that followed. Look at verse 8. And a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Well, this pharaoh decides to turn this problem into an advantage. He sees Israel as a cheap labor force. And notice the reason for his plan in verse 10. Come, let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply. Pharaoh intended to oppress them so severely that they would die off. But oppression didn't keep their numbers down. Verse 12, the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied. The more the pharaohs thought to thwart God's purposes and plans, even unknowingly, the more God demonstrated his faithfulness to promise, his promise to multiply Israel. Well, you know the story. One of the pharaohs commands the Hebrew midwives to put the infant boys to death as soon as they are born. Well, if we can't kill them through forced labor, let's kill them through murder, but let's let the midwives do it. But the midwives midwives wanted no part of this. So Pharaoh orders his own people to murder the boys. And it's in that context, Moses is born with his life in jeopardy. Where in the providence of God, Pharaoh's daughter takes him as her own, where, while the people of Israel suffer. And as we think of the slavery in Israel that Israel experienced, slavery is not just the circumstance where God would prove himself faithful. But Israel's slavery itself proved that God's word could be trusted. Genesis 15, 13 said, Know for certain that your seed will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. Everything was happening exactly as God said it would. And during four centuries of mistreatment, God preserved and incubated this small family, multiplying them into a mighty people ready for God to fulfill his next promise. So in chapter 2, 40 years later, Moses takes justice into his own hands and he murders an Egyptian. Moses was from the tribe of Levi. Moses was a murderer from a tribe named after a murderer. He was living up to the family name. This new pharaoh intended to kill Moses in retribution, so he flees and spends 40 years in the desert of Midian, gaining a wife 
and has a son along the way. In the closing of chapter 2, almost 430 years after Israel's arrival in Egypt, God's character is put on display. Let's read Exodus 2, beginning in verse 23. Now it happened in the course of those many days that the king of Egypt died, and the sons of Israel sighed because of the slavery. And they cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery rose up to God. So God heard their moaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God saw the sons of Israel, and God knew them. This is relationship language. Think of the purpose of the book. Israel's suffering had not escaped God's notice, and he hadn't forgotten his covenant. In his promise, he had been working to bless them and multiply them in their suffering. God's remembering here should be understood as God's decision to act in accordance with his eternal purposes, which was always to bring Israel out of Egypt after 400 years of mistreatment. So, did God act because of the Israelites' prayer? Or, and, and because of their cry, or because this was the time that he always intended to act? Yes. God sovereignly uses the prayer of his people to bring about his sovereign purposes. With that, we move into chapters 3 and 4. The next section, God reveals, calls, and promises. In Exodus 3, verse, through this section, God reveals himself and calls Moses while he's shepherding His father-in-law's flock near Horeb, another name for Mount Sinai. Read verse 2 of chapter 3. And the angel of Yahweh appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire. Yet the bush was not consumed. The angel of Yahweh is best to be understood here as the pre-incarnate Christ, the Son of God. And the angel of Yahweh tells him in verse 5, Do not come near. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. This is the first use of the word holy in the Bible. Whenever the omnipresent God takes it upon himself to occupy physical space, that space around him is to be considered holy. It's distinct or set apart. Because of that, Moses' approach to this space must be different than every other space in the wilderness. Let's look at verse 6, still in chapter 3. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Skip down to verse 8. So I have come down to deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up from the land to a good and spacious land to a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 8 makes clear that one of the goals of the Exodus is to fulfill the land promise. And this land is promised to be a good land. Yahweh Yahweh reveals himself to Moses and calls him to speak to Israel and Pharaoh and to lead his people out of Egypt. But Moses is fearful. He asks in verse 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and lead this people out of Egypt? He might be thinking, hey, I killed a guy. The last Pharaoh drove me out. Doesn't seem like too good of an idea to go back into and march into the new Pharaoh. But God comforts Moses in verse 12. Certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt You shall serve God at this mountain. Well, Yahweh promises that his presence will be with Moses. What a comfort that would be. The angel of Yahweh would be with Moses. The issue is not who Moses is, but rather who will be with Moses. But Moses asked the familiar question. If they ask me, what is your name? What shall I say? And God answers in verse 14. I am who I am. Tell them I am has sent me. In this statement, I am, is connected to the name of Yahweh, which is derived from a a verb to be. It speaks to Yahweh's existence, uh, his self-existence. But the name I am who I am probably also has connection to the same verb just two verses earlier in verse 12 when God said, 
certainly I will be with you. Moses didn't seem to question Yahweh's existence. He could see him in the bush. He was speaking with him. But Moses was very concerned about what would happen when he went down the mountain. Would God remain with him? And that's why this, God's promise would have been so comforting. When God says, I am who I am, using the same verb as I will be with you, he is communicating in his very name that he is the God who will be with Moses. This is the promise of his very presence. And this also helps us understand an otherwise challenging statement of Yahweh's in Exodus 6. And just listen. Exodus 6.3, I am Yahweh, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Well, a reading of Genesis reveals that the name Yahweh was in use a long time before Moses. So what are we to make of this? Um, God Almighty, also known as the angel of Yahweh, is the one who appeared to Abraham when he brought Isaac to Mount Moriah in Genesis 22 who appeared to Isaac in Genesis 25, and who wrestled with Jacob in Genesis 35. And now he appears before Moses in the burning bush. But one thing these earlier appearances of God had in common is that they were temporary. They knew his name Yahweh, but they had not known his abiding, continual relational presence in the way that God would soon reveal himself. God had appeared to them, but he had not yet dwelt with them. So his names, I am who I am, and Yahweh communicate his abiding relational presence with his people and his commitment to keep his covenant promises. Well, in chapter 4, Moses returns to Egypt and he and Aaron tell Israel about Yahweh's planned deliverance. And even before the confrontation with Pharaoh begins, the Lord not only anticipates Pharaoh's obstinance, but explains that he will be the cause of it. Read in verse 21 of chapter 4. And Yahweh said to Moses, When you go to return to Egypt, see to it that all the miraculous wonders which I have put in in your hand, that you do them before Yahweh. But as for me, I will harden his heart with strength, so that he will not let the people go. Moses will talk to Pharaoh, but he won't listen. Yahweh promises to harden Pharaoh's heart. And God himself will be the active agent of hardening here. Well, that brings us to the next section. which stretches from chapter 5 all the way through the end of the Exodus in chapter 15. God commands, judges, redeems, and delivers. And this is probably the most familiar portion of the book, and we'll spend the most time here. And it covers the confrontations between Moses and Pharaoh, the plagues, the Passover, and the crossing of the Red Sea. And after Moses gives God's command to Pharaoh to let God's people go, verse 2 of chapter 5 sets up an important theme in this section of the book. Look at chapter 5, verse 2. But Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice to let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh, and also, I will not let Israel go. The section is introduced by the question, who is Yahweh? Pharaoh refuses God's command, makes the Israelites work harder, and the Israelites despair, and they oppose Moses. In chapter 6, Yahweh speaks to Moses. Look at verse 4 of chapter 6. And I also establish my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. Continue in verse 6. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the hard labors of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their slavery. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then I will take you from my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God who brought you up out from under the hard labors of the Egyptians. In verse 4 and 6 of chapter 6, we're reminded of the land promised to Abraham. And in verse 7, we see another major theme, which is the establishment of a relationship between the Lord and Israel, and also the importance of knowing Yahweh. Pharaoh didn't know Yahweh, and Israel needs to know Yahweh. Well, let's turn to the plagues, 
In verse 30 of chapter 6, Moses asked God, who had commanded him to speak to Pharaoh, I am of uncircumcised lips. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? Moses doesn't yet understand what God is doing with Pharaoh. But God graciously responds and grants Moses' request to have Aaron speak on his behalf. But God wants Moses to see the bigger picture. Skip ahead to chapter 7, verse 3. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart with stiffness, that I may multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh. Neither Moses nor Aaron's words will be affected before Yahweh, I mean before Pharaoh. Yahweh is hardening in order that he may multiply signs, in order that the Egyptians will know Yahweh. Well, in chapter 8, verse 10, after the plague of frogs, Moses asks Pharaoh, when would you like the frogs to leave? Surprisingly, Pharaoh says, tomorrow. I wonder why Pharaoh didn't say today or right now, Moses. But maybe I can't, I think I can handle these frogs one more day. Perhaps he didn't want to face Moses face to face when Moses removed the plague and have to admit Yahweh's power. Moses responds, tomorrow it will be so that you may know that there is no one like Yahweh our God. So in verse 15, Pharaoh gets relief, but what is his heart's response? He hardened his own heart with firmness and did not listen to them. Pharaoh's hardness of heart resulted from refusing to listen and obey God's commands. Pharaoh here is the active agent of his own hardening. In verse 22 of chapter 8, we see a a new theme introduced. God says to Pharaoh through Moses that when the flies come, verse 22, on that day I will make a distinction for the land of Goshen where my people are living so that no swarms of flies will be there that you may know that I, Yahweh, am in the midst of the land. Well, there are a couple important things to note here. First, God purposed that the nations would see Israel as a distinct people. Secondly, God is in Israel's midst, and he wanted Pharaoh to know. This connects back to the theme and purpose of God's presence with Israel. Well, the next plague is the death of the livestock, and notice again in 9.4, but Yahweh will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt so that nothing will die of all that belongs to the sons of Israel. God distinguishes Israel from Egypt. Now, look at chapter 9, verse 12. And at the end of the plague of boils, notice, And Yahweh hardened Pharaoh's heart with strength, and he did not listen, just as Yahweh had spoken to Moses. Both God and Pharaoh are both active in the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. God is sovereign, yet not in a way that, does not, that removes responsibility from Pharaoh. Still in chapter 9, at the beginning of the plague of hail, we find that God's purpose in sending the plagues is so that Pharaoh will know that there is no one like Yahweh. He has no equal or rival. Look at verse 15. For if by now I had sent forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would then have been wiped out from the earth. But indeed, for this reason, I have caused you to stand in order to show you my power and in order to recount my name throughout all the earth. These plagues weren't needed. God could have wiped out Pharaoh and all the Egyptians. He didn't need this back and forth contest. So why does he do it? in order to show his power and proclaim his name in all the earth. It was previously suggested that the theme of the Bible is the glory of God as king who judges and saves, and you must be in relation to him. Well, here in Exodus 9, we have God putting his power and glory and name on display through his judgment. Turn to chapter 10, verse 2. And and here we learn that God set these things among them, verse 2, 
so that you may recount in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I dealt severely with the Egyptians and how I put my signs among them that you may know that I am Yahweh. Two points here. Israel needed to know Yahweh and his power and his authority and his severity against disobedience. And Israel needed to pass its knowledge of God along to its children. Moving along still, after a supernatural darkness covered all of Egypt for three days, Pharaoh finally permits them to take all the people to go worship, even their children, but he demands, leave your flocks and your herds. He fears that if he lets them take their livestock, they'll never return. He's unwilling to lose his labor force, and he's unwilling to have them potentially join his enemies. He's driven by fear, pride, and selfish ambition. So not surprisingly, in 1027, his heart is hardened again. In chapter 12, we we skip ahead a couple chapters, and now we are preparing for the last plague. Israel is instructed to take a male lamb or a young goat without blemish, slaughter it, and brush its blood on the doorpost of their houses. Let's read chapter 12, verses 12 through 13. And I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. And the blood shall be for a sign for you on the houses where you are. And I will see the blood, and I will pass over you. And there shall be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. While all the firstborns, of the Egyptians were to die in the plague, God passed over the homes of the Israelites based on the bloodshed and death of an innocent, unblemished substitute. And at the end of chapter 12, we read the outcome. The firstborn of every household, including every animal, perished. And in chapter 12, verse 30, we read of a great cry in Egypt. And after which Pharaoh finally sends Israel away. In chapter 13, we hear a bit more divine commentary on the death of the firstborn. Look at verse 15 of chapter 13. And it happened when Pharaoh hardened his heart with stiffness about letting us go, that Yahweh killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to Yahweh the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. Yahweh delivered the firstborn of Israel from death by killing a substitute lamb in their place. In chapter 13, we also learn that Yahweh, the angel of God, was going before them as they left Egypt in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to give them light. Chapter 13, verse 22, we read, He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. God was now leading them with his presence. He leads them to camp by the sea and As Pharaoh sees it, Israel is trapped by the sea. So in chapter 14, Pharaoh pursues. And the people of Israel begin to despair, and they accuse Moses of leading them to die. Moses responds in verse 13 of chapter 14. Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Yahweh will fight for you and you will keep silent. So Yahweh plans one last climactic judgment against, Israel, against Egypt to make himself known. Look at verse 17. And as for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians with strength so that they will go in after them and I will be glorified through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh when I am glorified through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. How would God glorify himself? In verse 19, the angel of God moves from before them to behind them as a barrier between them and Egypt. 
And then look at verse 21. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh swept the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea into dry ground. So the waters were split. So the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. This is God's power on display. We know the story. The Egyptians give chase. They enter the sea. God causes confusion, and the Egyptians get stuck. And they cry out in verse 25, and as they see what's finally happening, let us flee from Israel, for Yahweh is fighting for them against us. They're beginning to understand, too late. And the waters come crashing down on the Egyptians. Now look how it ends in verse 30. Thus, Yahweh saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. And then Israel saw the great hand which Yahweh had used against the Egyptians. And the people feared Yahweh. And they believed in Yahweh and in his servant Moses. Israel begins to trust Yahweh and Moses, at least superficially. God glorifies himself through the judgment of the Egyptians and the deliverance of the Israelites. And one more thing about this, something that we should take note is in Exodus 12, 12, we read, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am Yahweh. For each of the 10 plagues, Yahweh displayed his own superiority over the supposed gods of the Egyptian pantheon. With each successive plague, God was proving the inadequacy of the gods who supposedly ruled over parts of nature, proving again there is no one like Yahweh. In Exodus 15, we come to the Song of Moses and Israel. And this concludes the Exodus and starts the journey to Israel or to Sinai. And Israel and Moses offer a song of gratitude that praises God as more powerful than Pharaoh, more powerful than the sea and the nations. But at its very center is an emphasis on the uniqueness and the holiness of God. Look at verse 11 of chapter 15. Who is like you among the gods, O Yahweh? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, fearsome in praises, working wonders? Israel is to be distinct or holy among the nations because God is distinct and holy. There is none like him. Two verses later, in verse 13, we read, In your loving kindness you have guided the people whom you have redeemed. God redeemed not only the firstborns of Israel, but also the whole nation. In verse 16, Israel is called the people whom you have purchased. And then finally, we read verse 17. You will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Yahweh, which you have made for you to inhabit, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. Notice the dual focus here of the future inheritance in the promised land and God's dwelling with his people. Well, the last section in this first third of the book is from the middle of 15 through the end of 18, and this is God sustains. And these chapters tell of Israel's travel between Egypt and Mount Sinai. God's people grumble and complain about bitter water, and God makes it sweet. He exhorts him in 1526, If you will earnestly listen to the voice of Yahweh your God and do what is right in his, in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have put on the Egyptians. This also serves as a warning if they do not listen. In chapter 16, the people long for the bread and the meat of Egypt, grumbling and complaining again to Moses and accusing Moses of bringing them out to starve. And they are responding in despair and unbelief. But God graciously reveals his glorious presence again and provides bread and meat from heaven, but they disobey again. And then Moses commands a Sabbath rest for God's people, but they disobey and they collect food anyway. And God says in 16, 28, How long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Israel seems destined to share in the plagues and the diseases of Egypt. In chapter 17, God provides water from a rock after the people complain. 
In 1707, the people questioned whether Yahweh was even among them. They doubted his presence despite his supernatural provision and his appearance before them on the rock. And at the end of chapter 17, God is still sustaining them. He protects them from an attack from the Amalekites. In chapter 18, they meet up with Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, who seems to have been a pagan priest. But as he hears about all that Yahweh has done, his response provides the conclusion to Pharaoh's question in chapter 5, verse 2. Who is Yahweh? In Exodus 18.10, Jethro answers this question. So Jethro said, Blessed be Yahweh, who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh, and who delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that Yahweh is greater than all the gods. So this ends the first section of the book, chapters 1 through 18, which report the Lord's faithfulness to his promises to Abraham, both to multiply his descendants and to bring them out of Egypt. So now we step into the second section. And this is, stretches from chapter 19 through 24, verse 11. And this is divine relationship through covenantal instruction. Israel is led to the mountain. Moses is called up to Mount Sinai by Yahweh. And Yahweh will give them the Mosaic covenant. This is divine instruction that would be a means of their ongoing covenantal relationship with Yahweh. The first section is God's appearance at Sinai. Chapter 19 records the appearance of, at Sinai to Moses in front of the people. And certainly there's some miraculous things that would be fun to spend time with, but we're going to focus on verse 5. And there we find a summary of the Mosaic covenantal promise that God will soon enter into with his people. Let's look at 19.5 together. And this is a, serves a sort of a summary of the Mosaic covenant. So now then, if you will indeed listen to my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Notice this summary of the covenant is conditional. What is the condition? If Israel will obey his voice and keep his covenant. And what will be the result if they obey? Israel shall be his treasured possession, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Treasured possession is picking up on the way that Genesis 12, 2 began to focus God's primary attention on Abraham and his family out of all the descendants of the world. Kingdom of priests, kingdom relates to dominion, reign, and priest relates to those who would mediate blessing and access to God. So this is the role Adam and Eve had in the garden, but was lost. God promises if they will obey, Israel will fulfill the role of dominion over God's creation and mediate God's blessings to the world. And they are to be a holy nation. They are to be set apart from the world and to Yahweh. What do the people do? They pledge to Moses to obey all that God, all that Yahweh has said. So on the third day, Yahweh comes down with a thick cloud, thunder, lightning, sound of a trumpet, and he speaks to Moses so that all the people can hear him. And like the burning bush, this mountain is to be set apart as holy. Moses and Aaron, later Joshua, will be permitted on the mountain, but not the people, lest they die. There are a few different components to the covenant narrative, and therefore a few different components to the Mosaic Covenant. We already looked at the summary in 19.5, but next we see God gives 10 commandments. These 10 commandments serve as the first of two parts that give detail to the summary of 19.5. And we'll look just briefly at the opening of the 10 commandments in chapter 20, verse 2. I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Notice in this verse, the identity of Yahweh is the one who brought them out of Egypt. Well, after the Ten Commandments, we see God gives the book of the covenant. 
And that's chapters 21 through 23. And the book of the covenant are just de- are detailed instructions explaining how Israel is to live that further flesh out 19.5 as well as the Ten Commandments. And so as these are the two primary components of the Mosaic Covenant, we'll see another piece when we get to Deuteronomy given on the plains of Moab. But just a couple comments on the relationship between God's covenant with Abraham and God's covenant with Moses. And we should understand that the Mosaic Covenant is distinct from the Abrahamic Covenant, but they're related. The Abrahamic Covenant is unconditional. It's everlasting. Now, there are expectations for Abraham and his descendants, but its ultimate fulfillment cannot be thwarted. In the Mosaic Covenant, we see specific requirements Abraham's descendants must obey in order to experience the blessings of the Abrahamic Covenant. And it's spelled out in much greater detail. But unlike the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant was conditional. If Israel did not fulfill it, it could be nullified. And if this were to happen, some other means would be necessary for Israel to experience the blessings of the unconditional Abrahamic covenant. So it is actually this conditionality of this covenant that lays the groundwork for a future better covenant. As sort of an epilogue to the book of the covenant before the formal ratification of it in chapter 24, let's look at chapter 23, verse 20. And we see an important statement about Israel's journey into the promised land. Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to keep you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Keep watch of yourself before him and listen to his voice. Do not be rebellious towards him, for he will not pardon your transgression, since my name is in him. But if you truly listen to his voice and do all that I speak, notice the connection between what he speaks and what I speak. This Yahweh, this angel is himself also Yahweh. Then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. And it goes on in the next verse as well. But God promised to send his angel before them, as he did when they left Egypt. But they must listen to him. They must obey him. If they do, he will defeat their enemies for them. And he will bring them safely into the promised land. But there is again a warning. If they won't listen to them, they will not be forgiven. They will be subject to God's judgment. So to end this section of the book, we see God's covenant, God covenants with his people. And this is the formal ratification of the covenant. Moses performs a ceremony to formally enter the people into this covenant relationship with Yahweh. Israel again pledges obedience to all that God has said. And this time they're responding to the, after the full book of the covenant has been given. And this covenant was ratified with annual sacrifice, and this time sprinkled on the people to consecrate them as holy. And the Mosaic Covenant, as long as it is in force, spells out the conditions for any given generation of Israel to inherit the promises of the Abrahamic Covenant. Finally, we come to the last section of the book. And this is the section of God's divine presence being facilitated and preserved. It goes from 2412 through the end of the book. And in this third and final section, Moses provides instructions from God for the building of the tabernacle. And he also explains afterwards how Israel actually erected the tabernacle. But between those two parts... Israel breaks the covenant. The first section is God gives instructions for his dwelling. In 2412, Moses was called back to the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, and the glory of Yahweh dwelt on the mountain, and the sons of Israel could see the consuming fire up on top of the mountain as Moses goes into the cloud to receive the instructions about the tabernacle. And so it's helpful to think about the purpose of the tabernacle. It is a dwelling place for God among Israel. It was a collapsible tent to be moved by the Israelites as they traveled to the promised land. 
Let's look at Exodus 25, verse 8. And let them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. You can also look at 29, 45 through 46. But one special item in the tabernacle is worth calling out. And that is the the Ark of the Testimony or the Ark of the Covenant. And this is an acacia wood box that's overlaid with gold. And the testimony refers to the two stone tablets of the Ten Commandments that were placed inside the box. And then the lid or the cover of the Ark, which was called the mercy seat, sat above it. God in his glory would actually dwell above the mercy seat. And then under the mercy seat, inside the Ark, would be the Ten Commandments. So the mercy seat, sprinkled with blood, actually stood between God and the broken law. So why? Why is this tabernacle needed? Though Yahweh will once again dwell with his people, it's not the same as the garden. Man can no longer enjoy uninhibited communion with Yahweh. The tabernacle will maintain a degree of necessary separation between the people and Yahweh. Again, Yahweh's presence is to be treated as holy and different than all other space. And while the tabernacle provided a way for God's presence to dwell among the people, even it had a veil that prevented access from all but the high priest from going into the Holy of Holies. And even the high priest needed to be especially consecrated with blood prior to entering And this brings us to chapter 32. God renews the broken covenant. For the covenant to be renewed, it must first be broken. And Moses has already given the people the Ten Commandments. He's given them the book of the covenant. But while Moses is up on Mount Sinai, receiving the instructions of the tabernacle and what it will be needed to worship there that we just read about, the Israelites were busy bowing and dancing under Aaron's leisureship to a graven image, a golden calf that supposedly depicted Yahweh, directly violating at least the first and second commandments. And God commands Moses, go down at once. He sees the, their idolatry. He breaks the tablets, burns the calf, grinds it to powder, sprinkles it over the water, and forces Israel to drink it. The broken tablets symbolize that the covenant has been broken. The idea of God's relational presence going with Israel into the promised land seems to be at an end. Moses has shattered the Ten Commandments. The covenant looks to be nullified. How will God's people get to experience the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant now? Well, a turn of events comes in chapter 34, verse 6. And then Yahweh passed by in front of Moses and called out, Yahweh, Yahweh, God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. After this proclamation of God's character as compassionate and forgiving, Yahweh graciously restores the covenant that Israel had already broken. And this demonstrates his compassion, his his forgiveness. The the Israelites are punished, but still in 32 verse 34, God promises his angel will still go with Israel. What grace. He will not remove his presence from them at this time. In response to Moses' intercession on behalf of Israel, God is willing to continue his covenant with them in his mercy. And God uses the prayer of his people to accomplish his predetermined plan. Israel's transgression certainly threatened Yahweh's presence among them, the very thing that the tabernacle was intended to facilitate. And the only reason the covenant is renewed is because of God's mercy. And by the end of chapter 34, we know that if the continuation of this covenant depends upon the obedience of the Israelites, it has no hope. It depends solely on God's mercy. So finally, the last section, God dwells among his people. 
verses, chapters 35 to 40. The book of Exodus concludes with a step-by-step description of the construction of the tabernacle. One year after the Exodus, the tabernacle is set up, and God takes residence in the tabernacle, thus now residing in the midst of his people. And this scene is dramatic. The cloud from Mount Sinai now fills the, the tabernacle, and his presence would now dwell among his people. And let's read this account in Exodus 40. We'll, we'll read verse 34. And then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Skip to verse 36. Now throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all the journeys, the cloud of Yahweh was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel. And this is quite significant in the biblical storyline. We haven't seen such a consistent dwelling of God with man since the fall in Genesis 3. And these last two sections of the book, the Mosaic Covenant and the Tabernacle, highlight God's, the restoration of God's relational presence with them. He will be present with them, and he will be in relationship with them through his law. And they are his people, he is their God, and he now dwells in their midst. And then we get to the end of Exodus. And looking forward, I want to just think about one component. Recall chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. God is the one who forgives iniquity, transgression, He keeps loving kindness for thousands, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Yahweh demonstrated after the golden calf his patience, his mercy, his forgiveness. But his perfect justice also means that he will punish the guilty. And what happens if Israel transgresses the covenant again? If chapters 32 to 34 show us anything, is that Israel has not abandoned rebellion. So how can Israel remain in the Mosaic Covenant and maintain God's relational presence moving forward? If Adam and Eve were exiled from the garden because of their sin, how will God live in Israel's midst while she is still sinful? And so to answer that question, Moses next wrote the book of Leviticus. And so in our final few minutes, I want to look at some application for us tonight. And the first, this should affect our worship. God is sovereign. He is sovereign over the opening and closing of wombs, political powers, history, nature, and over men's hearts. Worship God because he is faithful. If God was faithful to multiply Israel, lead them out of Egypt, and establish his presence with them as he promised, he can be trusted to keep his word today. He is compassionate. He hears the cries and prayers of his people. And he provides for our needs as he has determined. He knows our true needs. And he is good. And God works for the good of his children, even in suffering. This should affect our prayer lives. God accomplishes his purposes through his people's prayer. This is just a helpful reminder that God ordains both the ends and the means of bringing about his sovereign purposes. God's sovereignty and our prayers are not opposed to one another. We should pray for strength. Uh, God's purposes are not limited by man's strength, as Moses felt. God's strength is adequate to endure any circumstance and any temptation. Got a few verses for you there to, to look up. Remember God's name. At GBC, we love to use God's full name. Um, The use of Yahweh's name should remind you that he is our covenant-keeping God who brings us into relationship with him and he dwells with his people. Remember that when you see his name. And we are to take comfort in God's presence God, who once dwelled in the garden, then in a tabernacle, then a temple, finally came and tabernacled among men in Jesus Christ. And now, he dwells in each believer through his Holy Spirit in whom he has given us. 
We are his temple, and he has promised that he will never leave or forsake us, those who are in Christ. Trust God's purposes in your proclamation. When you proclaim God's word and the gospel and it doesn't have the desired effects in your hearers, trust that it always has the intended effect from God's perspective. We don't get to decide what God's purposes are, but we should rejoice in the privilege to be used in a, by God in accomplishing his good purposes, whatever they are. But again, it's still right to pray for fruit. Rejoice in the work of Christ. Christ is our Passover lamb. He was sacrificed as an innocent substitute to redeem us from the penalty of death and purchase us from the slavery of sin. The veil that separated man from God's glory inside the tabernacle has been torn in two. Jesus closed the gap between God and man, giving us direct direct access to the Father through the blood of his Son through faith in him. Rejoice in the work of Christ. And be watchful. Sin is deceitful. Hardness of heart is real. Hardness of heart is a result of not responding to God's word in faith and obedience, and it will lead to ruin. Look up later Hebrews 3. 12 through 19. And this is direct, the next one is directly out of the theme of, of Exodus. You must know Yahweh. You must be in right relationship with him. It is painful for those who resist him and oppose him, but a blessing to those who trust him. Judgment came upon the Egyptians who did not know him. Judgment is coming for all who do not know him today. You must know him. And your children must know Yahweh. Tell your children about the Lord. And notice what Israel was to instruct the children about in chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. Recount in the hearing of your son and grandson how I dealt severely with the Egyptians. Tell them how I wiped out the Egyptians. Your children need to know about God's hatred for sin. We can't water down the gospel for our children. They must know him. And finally, put off grumbling and cultivate gratitude. Heed the warning of 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Do not grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instructions. Rather than grumbling and complaining, Give thanks to God in everything and do all things without grumbling or disputing. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have made us to know your Son and that your Son destroyed the dividing wall that was between us and the Father because of our sin. Lord, thank you that you have redeemed us from the slavery of sin. Thank you that Christ became our Passover lamb. And the sin that we committed was put on him as an innocent sacrifice and substitute that we might be brought into your family. Lord, help us to trust you. Help us to trust you when people don't respond as we think they should. Help us to trust you when our circumstances don't seem favorable to us, you are working. You are good. Lord, help us to respond in gratitude when maybe we look and there's things that we think we, we deserve that we don't have. You are good and you can be trusted. It's in your name we pray. Amen.